if you'll indulge me. Um, my dad's best friend grew up in Maria Junction. I'm sorry. It is so moving for me to be part of this whole historical, um, wonderful industry. After all, the coming out here in the 60s and looking forward to finding some fresh Colorado peaches and fresh Colorado cherries, and now I get to be part of this industry and meet all those people who are doing that 30 years ago. So, <clears throat> sorry. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that was a choice for less than mine. Of course it was Colorado wine. Well, all right, there was a little bit of Spanish wine, but it wasn't as good. It wasn't as good. I am really thrilled tonight to be able to talk about my longtime friend and wine mentor, uh, Mr. Dave Tewksbury. Dave is one of the people who's responsible for building the pyre and fanning the flames that became the Colorado wine industry, both locally produced and imported. Dave began his wine career at one of the first and still one of the best wine shops anywhere in the state, which is the Vineyard in Cherry Creek during the 1970s. He worked his way up to being the manager there. The Vineyard has always been a key account uh, to go to to introduce new products. So it's no surprise that one of the products Dave introduced while he was at the Vineyard was Colorado Mountain Vineyards in 78. Dave knew Ann and Jim Seawold well, and he recalls detouring from one of his frequent fishing trips to the Grand Mesa in order to tour the new vineyards of the Grand Valley with Ann and Jim. At the time, he says the vineyards meant uh, a couple of small plots of vines and palisade connected to orchards and three rows of Chardonnay in a Clifton backyard. <laughs> Is that backyard owner here tonight? I don't know. Um, Dave was acquainted with Jim and Ann from their home winemaking store in Denver, and another of his vineyard customers uh, at the vineyard wine shop was Eric Bruner, uh, who became the founding winemaker and partner in Plum Creek Cellars and was the mentor and instructor of the esteemed Jenny Baldwin Eaton. Uh, Dave joined wholesaler Lido Dionysus in 1979. At the time, Lido was the source for fine wine, innovative wine, and unique wines. I first met Dave when I was a, a fledgling uh, restaurant worker at the Broker restaurant downtown. Dave was the source of almost every wine of the month that we used to pour at the Broker restaurant. And it was always an exciting thing to see Dave come and visit and taste us on some new wines because there was always something exciting there. And at Lido, among the wines he represented was Colorado Mountain Vineyards. In 1985, he left the wholesale industry and opened the wine company on South University Boulevard in Littleton, uh, another of the early, really, truly fine wine shops in Denver. And there, he met the other co-founder of Plum Creek, Doug Phillips. And Doug asked Dave to testify at, as a retailer in front of the Colorado legislature in support of the Colorado Wine Industry Development Act that Doug and Steve had written in 1990. Doug and Steve and Bennett. Is, is Bennett here tonight? Okay. All right. Um, that was the legislature that created the Colorado Wine Board and its funding stream. For two years, Dave worked uh, with Joel Diner as a wine bro at a wine brokerage called Cask and Barrel Marketing when he became the director of training at Western Distributing, one of the largest and most diverse wholesale, wholesalers in the beverage alcohol business in 1993, he also became the first wholesaler representative to the Colorado Wine Board. He has served on the Colorado Wine Board for a total of 12 years. How are you still standing? It's <laughs> a lot of brain damage. Since that time, including, um, uh, he served 12 years since that time, including serving as the board chair from 2009 until the end of his term in 2010. He also created and chaired the Colorado Wine Board Restaurant Committee, which worked not only to make restaurants more aware of Colorado wines, but also to train Colorado wineries uh, how to effectively call on and sell to problematic restaurants accounts. Not the good restaurants account, mind you, the problematic <laughs> restaurant. The problem, Charlie. In 1996, 
Uh, Dave opened Tewksbury and Company, a tobacconist in Writers Square in downtown Denver. He and Doug Phillips worked out the model agreement for hosting a winery's remote sales and tasting room, and Tewksbury and Company has been selling Colorado wines exclusively since 1999. Until liquor stores opened on Sundays in 2008, Dave supplied the wine needs for the ever-increasing downtown Denver urbanites by offering Colorado wines. There were a lot of really hungover people on Sundays who were glad to have Dave open selling wine. Thank you. You made a lot of people very happy. But he is not championing Colorado wines or convincing a new restaurant that he frequents to carry his favorite local wines. He can be found fly fishing in the high country. Dave has been a frequent fishing buddy with former CWIDB director John Glowey. So whether you need some advice on wine sales or the proper fly, Dave's your man, right there. Okay. I have never met anyone with so much energy and enthusiasm and commitment to the wine business, and it is an infectious enthusiasm. Um, I am proud to count Dave Tewksbury as one of my oldest friends. One of my friends, one of the people I have known the longest, not one of the oldest, uh, in the wine business, and the one, uh, and one of the greatest friends that Colorado wine is known as well. Dave, thank you very much. Now I suppose you want me to talk. Hey, let me just tell you a couple of brief things. I am so excited to be here because my family roots go back to 1889 in eastern Colorado, in, in rural Morgan County. Um, I can still remember at the age of five years old, my grandfather telling me stories of how tough it was that they actually uh, uh, were having to just, just like the, the stories I think that John was telling us, uh, or in some of the other folks, moving just rocks and trying to prepare soils that had never been touched for agriculture before. That left a lasting impression on me. But what was really funny is that when Doug had mentioned that we, you know, we certainly knew Eric Bruner um, and Jim and Ann Seawall, the very earliest pioneers of Colorado wine. And of course in those days, they were convinced in early days, some of you may remember this, that the best wines were probably going to be over in Arvada. <laughs> Not sure where they got that idea, but it was short-lived after the first winter, which was much like this one. Over here, only about 10 degrees colder at night. So we decided to move things over to the western slope, where we'd already proven that we could grow grapes from the late 1800s on. Why not go back to where we knew we could grow grapes? Here we are today. And uh, I just want to thank those pioneers, not only in the grape and wine business, but those of you with orchards um, and, and other crops that are represented here tonight, because my family's feelings are the same with you. Oh, by the way, you know, my dad was a city boy, and I can still remember my grandmother telling me the, the, the touching stories of what, well, it really wasn't wine. No, she made bathtub gin during uh, the Depression. <laughs> <laughs> and my father actually would take it down to certain customers down downtown Denver. <laughs> so that's the closest I got to wine, really, back in the, that side of the family. But um, I can remember that when we first had wine at my wholesale company, that we would go out and tell people that, gosh, we've got wines from Colorado. And after they would stop laughing hysterically, I would actually get them to taste the wine. And uh, we were just talking about this earlier this evening, and, and those of you that don't know wine, uh, bear with me, but uh, those of you that do will get a good laugh out of this. The two most successful wines I was selling at the time from Colorado was Chenin Blanc and Gamay. Whoa. Now, we know how popular they are today. <laughs> In fact, none of you have ever had those, so don't even laugh. But it's, uh, it's true, we had to experiment with something, so we tried lots of different crops lots of different grapes to see which ones were going to work. And if it wasn't for those early days, we wouldn't have the wonderful Cabernet Sauvignons, Merlots, Cabernet Francs, Riesling, Chardonnay, and the life that we grow in Colorado today. Um, but I just wanted to tell you that if anything else, to come from zero wineries when I started out with my connections with Colorado wines, 
um, to where we have, uh, I think, over 100 uh, different labels now in Colorado um, has been nothing short of amazing. And I've got to tell you, um, a couple of speakers touched on this earlier, but it all comes down, no matter if you're in the wine business or other fruit growing business, to passion. Your passion for growing that fruit and for getting people to believe in your product and in your state is what it's taken to get to where we are today. And that's why every day, one way or the other, I proudly tell people, <laughs> Colorado wine. <laughs> and don't be afraid to show it on everything that you have, whether you want a hat tonight from you know, an implement company or a tractor company or whatever. It's all part of our farming and agriculture in Colorado. And that is a winning combination. Never give up your passion for Colorado fruit.